So our first reader is Tanisra, who is a beloved teacher for many of us, teacher and mentor, uh, and an incredible inspiration and example uh, for standing up for uh, what needs to be said and what needs to be done. She uh, was raised in London, is Anglo-Irish, and she's a Dharma teacher, poet, and a former Theravadan monastic for 12 years. She and her husband Kitasaro founded Dharmagiri Retreat Center in KwaZulu-Natal and found themselves in the middle of the AIDS pandemic there and uh, initiated several AIDS relief projects uh, and uh, care for the orphans of, uh, that were left by people who had died of AIDS. She's uh, the author of Time to Stand Up, an Engaged Buddhist Manifesto for Our Earth. And she's a, a poet who has written a few books. One of them is The Heart of the Bitter Almond Hedge Sutra. So, Tanisra. Thank you, Kitty. I wasn't expecting to, to um, go first, but um, I just want to also context the, the projects that they were, they were made possible by the funding and energy and effort of San Francisco Insight. Um, so since the year 2000, there's a long history of collaboration <clears throat> and the work there in uh, rural, rural uh, KwaZulu on the border of um, Lesotho in South Africa. So this, this text, the uh, Bitter Almond Hedge, arose from um, some of the deep contemplations of my time, um, nearly 25 years of being immersed in the South African context. Um, and of course, the world of apartheid and post-apartheid, um, which is a global phenomena, the colonial project and its impact. And this, this, is a, this was a, a poetry piece um, that I actually wrote in 2013, although I think it's still relevant because it talks about the walls being built, the apartheid walls. Um, and then the, it con contrasts that with the, the, the no walls of the mind, as in the Heart Sutra, the, the imperative to go beyond all walls. I haven't got time to read, I can only pick out a few bits. I did also context it with the writings of the Khoisan, the First Nation peoples, the Khoisan calling themselves the First Standing Their peoples, um, the original people, so-called Bushmen, um, of, that, of those lands. Um, whose presences um, are very uh, tangible in a way, the spirit and the ancestors of those people are still very tangible. So I'll just read a little bit from um, this whole theme of walls and beyond walls and breaking down walls um, and the building of walls <laughs> and the revolution that needs to um, demolish the, those walls. And in the, you know, just to reference the bitter almond hedge when the settlers first came in the um, 1700s, mid 1600s actually, um, one of the first things they did, they stopped off in Cape Town, um, which was just an en route shipping stop onto um, the spice kingdoms of, that they were plundering in uh, India and so on, until it was settled or invaded. Um, but they, they grew a, almond, a bitter almond hedge to keep themselves the white settlers around Cape Town, what's now Cape Town, around the first settlement to keep themselves as apart from Africa. And so in many ways, and that, the, the descendant of that bitter almond hedge is still in the botanical gardens there on the edge of the Table Mountain. But that uh, almond hedge in a way became internalized and eventually became legislated apartheid. So it's this, this the hedge that became the wall <clears throat> all dead people and all animals walk one path. Dead hemsbok, dead ostriches, dead boars and dead bushmen all walk that path. The dead walk a path that is a bushman's path. It is the path of the first Khoisan path. Things that are flesh and those which dying must go away. But I, who am the moon, I do this, I return. Babo said this. Just to introduce the voice of the First Nation. And then I just riff off that into the poem. 
In these times before we arrived, lions spoke slowly, their hot breath alive with the essence of stars. Moonlight heart beats in slow peeling night spirals that twist like floating mobiles over a baby's cot, winding their airless way through pressed down pages of woven history. Floating unspoken sounds of our abandoned hearts grow, grow silently into a wall which sides and edges that push up to skin and differences that set apart. So we no longer float or flow or belong to each other. On each side where difference crushes down, the wall reaches up. And just as this bitter almond hedge sent us marching with this wall to some strange beat through lonely landscapes in our tight red coats where sweat from heat and dreams longing thread in strange days. And so it became war. We killed those non-humans. We did it again and again with stamp permits. Three Spungbrock, one lion and two Bushmen. The Bible said so, and we, crazy, neat, rational, civilized, superior, and aloof, white right to do so. On God's side, Europe of old winkled a thought from its pickled brain, and for everyone's sake set about to plant, trade, secure, ward off, beat down, push up and away into that dark, shadowy other that keeps you, queen of underworld, mouth of mysteries, Africa, far, far away. Through this mind's labyrinth, we slip, slide, and disappear down our cut-through hearts. This slope into forgetfulness draws up the floating wound that heaves under our neat exterior. Where the wail of a beast that knows no soothing weeps hot pain, it circles and circles, looking for fresh meat. Ripping through shreds of coherency, shards of hearts scatter to the icy winds during the darkening night, O oh, night of no stars, of no rescue, of lost things, of uncertain horizons, of souls turning, floating, twisting, and plummeting, so we can't sense the holding. At dawn, we lean into the wall that comforts with its tight breath and thin vein of reasons that catch agreements in the flick of an eye, the currency of our careful can cohesion, death, colonizing technology and mastering technology are parting from the land. Nguatu went to take a beast from the farmer but was shot and died on the hunting ground. The last bushman found with artist powder tied to his waist, 1921. Our lands, so quiet without us, grieve. Our sacred soul connection severed from our eland and grasses that blow in the hot dry winds alone. Here is our faint song, the weary arrow of our phantom reaching down from night stars. Our spirit is saying, this was our land. And as we are killed, your soul too ebbs away, left to the mercy we were of genocide's machination we were drained down into a corner of weakness, trying to sustain a self not dependent on others on blessed earth made us empty. We were weaned on grotesque machinery, on industrials numb rape, conquering and ransomed humans became engines, striding forth disembodied and perplexed. Their shiny gaze, their shiny gaze and traumatized hearts sway under corporate personhood. Now we sign ourselves away to walk the nights alone, morphing into hollow ghosts. This, our lost soul beats down and down into narrow passages of lonely wandering, where we now mindfully pick up the pieces along the path of our broken heart that tries, that tries so hard to find a way home. Pause. Pause and breathe fully a truce of hopeful, of hopeful confidence, seeded from the devastation of mad narcissistic lust to frack, extract tar sands, mainlining farmland, stolen and hammered, blown off mountaintops, stoking grandiose greed that crashes 
against emerging wild and violent protest. Finally, the bandage is off and the raw, stinking, suppurating gash rushes through the trapdoor we try to close shut over our tight, pounding heart. Breathe again, truly breathe. Try to pause longer as we fall like ballet dancers with no reference points, floating down. We whirl round and around through layers of sanity that dissolve quickly behind us glide and fall over our intimate heart beating strewn to the side as we crash against that wall. Just know the feeling in the feeling. Is it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral? Good ho, attend with each heartbeat, with each breath, with the out breath. Direct mindful awareness of feeling pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. It is unpleasant. Consuming fire of outrage shoots searing sensations into our flesh core, frozen grief at deceitful ruin, aches in every living cell, weighted stones of dreaded despair pull the heart down through each vertebrae into softening tissue of an oxygenated blood pumping pain. Chemical dissonance surges into brain coordination and scrambles insanity, trauma releases into the world. The beast has no holding. It roams and scavenges the desecrated, rotting flesh of grandiose structures that peel away from our faded, fast capitalist gods to abandon us all in the end. Here, enlightenment lands like a sick thump to the stomach. And at nights, we track mala beads along the wild stations of our heart so we can know the lost islands of our soul, like animals at a dry water hole. Goodbye tigers, goodbye lions, goodbye elephants, goodbye rhinos, goodbye orangutans, goodbye humble bumblebee, goodbye coral reefs, goodbye albatross, goodbye Amazon river, goodbye Arctic circle, goodbye us all. Hello, raging elemental storms of the world's end. So pause at the gate of no returning, at the edge of the wall, at its end game. From the collapsing furnace of known lands, fierce and urgent cries mop up denial. Millions sign all out now, quick, before it's too late, to walk again in the rose-scented garden where your soul patiently waits among shattered fragments of the empire, to break down the wall, of small expectations and from nightmares pull you awake. Quick, time, any time, here and now will do. Move forward your walled, from your walled pastimes to join the awakening, time yourself out from the needle of craving and boogie down with intense flamenco discipline passion so we can crash, crash this machine. Soar over the edge on the breath of your heart's sorrow and make a beloved circle outside that wall, where the storehouse of untamed dreams will decolonize our minds. We might pray, wail, and sometimes fail, but here we fall at the feet of that which has no name, which has all names printed into our authentic heart, woven into each part of joyous, sane, and connected primordial ease. Do it now, if not now, when? Death of the planet will not wait for another time, the perhaps or the maybe. Still, if someone should lean towards you on a cold forsaken night, inviting you to leave your castle wall, lean with her into your deepest longing because the storm is coming. Everything now means nothing except how much you reclaim your human that loves your life, your earth, you're all other living beings and every flower pushing through concrete on the way to work. Because this is the moment we've waited for. The moment for wild prayer, flash mobs, for occupying the corners of fascist madness. Sit your ground, stake your truth. And should you be brave, shout out to the far corners of the walls until the force of our sound together demolishes every carefully positioned brick. Time. With relentless halving your precious human life 
is short. Just as all life gathers proof of our faith through the pilgrimage of the night, it tests the grounds of our being so we may know the measure of courage and the wellspring of our heart from which we sip nectar. Just as the brown striped bug drinks from the wild elder flower, and the orange thin-winged butterfly skips through ochre grasses, and the grey knowing wharves move through cold white snow, and the rhinos through dry bush felt go. As lions stalk in parlour along the river slow, slow is the earth's rhythm, deep and unfathomable in our collective soul, the rhythm of the day's tick-tock winding through the web of our connection of internet consumption where we search what we hope to know because to truly know is to not know and to not know is so much evidence of where faith can go gate gate paragate parasangate bodhisvaha Oh, thank you, Tanisara. Yeah, you can see why we need a few uh, breaths in between <laughs> these readings. So powerful. Yeah, just as we uh, move on each time, I just invite each of us to just come back to our bodies or sense of feeling the contact with the earth, the place where we're in touch with the earth, feel our breaths, and just maybe noticing any emotional resonance in our bodies. So next is uh, Norm Maddox. Um, I met Norm because uh, Kim Shuck arranged a reading that we, uh, we read together. So I got introduced to Norm through his work, uh, which I loved immediately. Um, and actually this, this reading uh, was conceived because Noam, who's one of the board members at the SF Dharma Collective, teaches with, with uh, Noam teaches with Norm at the uh, Unified School District. And just one morning after we'd had a sit online uh, it, and we were thinking about the next climate conversation or whatever it was going to be, Noam said, do you know Norm Maddox? And I said, yes, I love Norm Maddox. <laughs> And so um, it, that just kind of made it just go, boom, we need to have a poetry reading. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's, that's how this came about. Uh, Norm is, uh, let's see, what have I done with that? He is a coach and uh, mentor for math teachers in the school district. And I love that his uh, his uh, email handle is math mathematics. Maddox is his last name. <laughs> uh, he's the author of Get Home Safe: Poems for Crossing the Community Grid. He's uh, born in the Bronx and uh, is a bilingual educator working for 30 years for the San Francisco Unified School District. So welcome, Norm. Hi. Good afternoon, good evening. Because uh, these days and these times, I'm just a poet. <laughs> not in the, uh, in the classroom, not in the school district, not in California. Oh my gosh. Oh. I'm... Uh, I'm over here in New York, as a matter of fact. Hmm. So um, I'm really, really grateful for the uh, the invitation that you all thought about me. And this was, you know, from the math domain, which is 
just thinking about stuff and, and the poetry, which is kind of out of my hands. Um, these are the pieces I have for you all this evening. No road maps in the sky. Moving forward and being present depends on the terrain surrounding your present. Moving forward and being present can be a climb, a Matterhorn face, vertical distance forward measured not equivalent to long distance hiking over foothills. Both require presence, one step at a time for every step. Present. 12 feet separating each footprint, either a giant's stride or one running before taking flight, steps becoming a flap of a wing, one step at a time for every step. Present, changing direction, choosing the course that has no trail, steps so small, no distance can be measured from one step to the next. Present, for each step, following a spiraling path with no direction, an inner compass guiding my present like constellations marking guideposts for pilots crossing immeasurable expanse of distance and time with a purpose, never arriving, moving forward, being present for every step, getting home safe. Uh, this piece is one that uh, I guess when we had to maintain that quarantine mentality. Will we ever hug again? How will it feel to bow warmly, not knowing if your partner is bowing at the same temperature when you can't even see them bowing so deeply? Will a puddle of tears demonstrate how long you stayed in your bow, crying, seeing a loved one for the last time, maybe? Coming home from away, will your child have to crawl to a spot on the floor to show how glad they are to see you? Will mental telepathy be the new caress, applying creative visualization chanting a mantra to resonate the vibe that nourishes spirit? Will the body transmit, radiate, and absorb feelings without the biofeedback that reminds us we are one human being with every one human being? What you see is what you get could be the new greeting, hopeful that you are genuinely wearing your heart on your sleeve painting a smile on your mask? Will ventriloquism become a new art form for whispering sweet nothings into your ear from six feet away? Will we become a society of voyeurs watching others pleasure themselves while we do our best to reciprocate? Will going to the doctor become unnecessary because the benefits of self-hugs will heal your own body with all that you used to share with love? Will a pivot in the psyche sustain the distance we are evolved to close? How long will it take before I can hold love in my arms again? This changes the temperature a little bit. This is some more of uh, uh, what's in that book, Get, Get Home Safe. And as a matter of fact, I could have written it yesterday. The Next Endangered Species. How is it that frogs, birds, and plants get protection and endangered species status? 
while a black man in America is still free game, like it's open season all year long, or in any age, any size black male? Is it because there are too many of us in one, in one place, say a congregation for you to feel safe? Is it because I'm whistling Vivaldi in the wrong key? Is it because my hands aren't raised high enough while my face down with your knee in my back? Or is it because I'm laying down while I'm standing my ground? Or could it be that I look like the boogeyman with a black face that you're afraid for your life? You don't know how afraid for my life, my son's life, my daughter's life, my daddy's life, my mama's life, my brother's life, my sister's life, my uncle's life, my auntie's life, my cousin's life, my grandma and grandpa's lives. Every time we step out of the safety of our own homes. Where's the sense we need to make of the dilemma that you are afraid for your life and you're the one with the gun, the one with the call for backup, the one with the power and the glory, amen. The one with the rigged law system that makes and breaks laws as we continue to hold our hands and not our heads high. Which government agency can a black man get to protect him from the encroaching gentrification that diminishes the habitat that used to be called a village turned ghetto where brothers and sisters are corralled by the economics of a progressive society that gives to its privileged and takes everything from the ones that have nothing but the two squares of, of space that they're standing on with some dignity. The FDA monitors and protects our food supply. The BLM monitors and guards our open spaces. The judicial system, whose lawful protocols are followed or not by their uniform proxies are supposed to monitor, protect, and serve all citizens all the time, and not just when it suits their case. Who will monitor and protect the black community against the armed racist fearful guardians of order, security, and peace that feel threatened by perpetrators with imaginary guns sprouting of their, out of their cold, twisted fingers? The numbers of free black males are dwindling. In spite of bro prayers in the White House, because of brother president, no matter. We dare not wait for the endangered species status that will have all black males with numbered ear tags, not earrings, and a GPS chip inserted all up in their grill to track movements through time and space and not yet to another planet. Reality has caught up to the nightmare. I can't breathe. Dreaming of being in life over my head, immersed in the challenges of society. I can't breathe. Buried under the weight of a 400 year old anvil planted in my chest. I can't breathe. Building the strength to swim against the currents with arms shackled behind my back. I can't breathe. Breaching the surface in time to explode my lungs, oxygen burning too fast like the fuse. I can't breathe unless in my dream becoming a nightmare, I evolve into a fire breathing dragon. I don't need your air anymore. The nightmare becoming real life, something's gonna burn. Fire is all I can breathe. This piece is called Ashes Rising. After the conflagration, memories of life, a long, slow roast of caged birds, an endless night of deferred dreams. Strange, low-hanging fruit rotting on the vine, calling you to a picnic you weren't invited to. Ancestors keep embers glowing, 
remember dreams flowing, not deja vu. Vision focused on the always now. Shedding darkness, not waiting for dawn, light filling the night. Resisting death wishes waiting in the shadows. Firebirds fly higher without singed feathers. You dream of a place to come true in. Like it or not, shelter in place, self-quarantine, an opportunity to go inside. Maybe build a rocket to explore your inner verse. Maybe invent the fuel for a rocket you've already built. Maybe leave your skin in a pile at the door, hand sanitizing raw knuckles peeling out of gloves like a snake, shedding lies between a rock and a hard head. Say goodbye to superficial thinking. We are the scouts exploring with inner vision. Time to go deep. Katie, how am I for time? Yeah, we're about there. Do you have another one to add? Yes, with? I. Uh, yes, I do. This is called ambivalence. The irony is that nature will continue to be Vedya, whether we see her or not, whether we are moved to tears or not. She is ambivalent to her beauty and glory while we are humbled by her presence, our own so ausencia. She will still bless flowers with their scent, whether our noses catch a whiff on the wind or notice the breeze with a, a hint of que se yo. She will share her blues with the sky from the darkest midnight blue to the blue that is translucent like nearly still waters at the end of a wave. The miracle that we notice that we are allowed to witness Gaia Mundo in all her minute esplendor is the blessing. The solitude of this quarantine has inspired visions of how it could be if we got out of our own way. Mm -hmm. Peace. Uh, thank you so much, Norm. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We can all use a little bit of that tapping our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I was just remembering another fact about Norm, which is that he was a math teacher for Kim Shuck's kids when they were growing up. <laughs> so there's a lot of interconnection here. <laughs> yeah, that's a good connection. Well, so next we have Tamina Khan. Uh, Tamina is an Indian American Muslim Zen practitioner. <laughs> and um, just took from another bio of hers. She spent her adult life writing, teaching, resisting, and mothering. She teaches English and creative writing at City College, uh, including the Poetry for the People class. I hope all those classes are persisting in the middle of all the uh, threats to cutting at the school. Uh, and she is author of uh, a book of poems called A Mom's Photo Album and Other Poems. Tamina. Thank you, Kitty. Um, I thank you, Norm, and uh, thank you, Tina Sara. This is really, I'm really humbled to be here um, in this gathering of poets um, in this place of sacred activism. Um, I'd uh, like to start with a poem called Twice as Hard. 
um, it's a poem um, for my son and for my father. Twice as hard. Your grandfather knew in 1963 that he had to work twice as hard as any white man to make it half as far. So he did diligent resource, re, so he did diligent research that boosted the work of established professors while he raised his family on poverty level stipends from one postdoctoral fellowship to another. In 1974, he took an industry job to make a stable home for his daughters. Being a brown girl, I knew I had to work three times as hard, but I didn't want to do it. I wanted to dream. He took me to his lab and showed me liquids and beakers and test tubes and dry ice evaporating into a white mist. I was never very good at chemistry. Obama is the son he never had, your grandmother told me, while we hoped against history. The man of color who worked twice as hard and got to be president and still, we know, only got half as far. The president, a father of daughters who said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. He'd look like you. Your seven-year-old self saw your own face in the face of the president. Your 15-year-old self sees your face in the faces of the dead. And now you face the face of one who worked half as hard and got twice as far. A face that disparages your face, your name, the direction of your prayers, the four boxes you check on your ethnic identity forms, the fusion meals hot and spicy you cook without spices, you cook without recipes, the fusion meals hot and spicy you cook without recipes, and your bargain is the same as your grandfather's. Work twice as hard, go half as far. His hard work travels with you in your veins, under your skin. Um, this next poem is called, uh, it's called Tassahara Nocturne. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, writing poetry um, in Tassahara at the Zen Monastery um, with uh, Naomi Shihab Nye and uh, Paul Haller. <clears throat> so this is from that experience. Moonless night. Stars beyond shadowy trees, deep chants, gentle bells, monks in black robes, soft footfalls on gravel paths. Again, a bell, resonance lingering, creak rushing, black silhouette of striped cat rubs her nose against my elbow. How long since I've cuddled with a cat, since a whiff of dander started to make me sneeze? I was ever the friend of cats. It's too late to know if the Ramadan, Ramadan moon has arrived. From this valley, I would have to walk up to the mountains, look at the horizon at sunset to witness the new crescent set in the magenta sky. Sacred month, overlapping sacred place in a profane country. Why are we shocked at iron-fisted tyranny in the United States and not when it rises in poor countries. Duterte, Modi, Netanyahu, Trump, all elected by voters on a rhetoric of exclusion, all pledging to make some place great again. My friend Ahmed named his daughter Haura, meaning freedom, when the statue of Saddam came crashing down in Baghdad. The best day of my life, he told a reporter. The refugees of 1991 could finally go home. All they wanted was to go home. And so I hoped with them, though I did not believe it possible, liberation delivered at the barrel of an invader's gun. And at the end of the day with no end, no one went home, not even me, who was born within the borders of this nation state and never had to take a test or pledge loyalty to stay, who can go back to the homeland whenever I want, even though these days it doesn't seem to want me. I thatched my roof with loss and wandering. I plastered my walls with hybrid languages, silence, and the names of the divine. I raised a child on the false promise of a fortified home, and he too is destined to wander. And tonight, all I have are stars, the creek, 
and the cat, and that will have to be enough. <laughs> So um, I have a couple of COVID-19 poems um, so that I wrote pretty recently. So this is called City on Pause. Spring sneaks up on us in the strange silence of the city. My car parked for a week up on the hill, rose gold clouds and turquoise water shimmer. At the ferry plaza, a lone man sings hallelujah to nobody. In the one open shop, I look past chocolate and gourmet sauces and settle on sour cherry jam from Greece, craving its bold sour sweetness. Hand-drawn signs and windows all across the city. Stay safe, San Francisco. We love you. Thank you, healthcare workers. A globe drawn in the shape of a heart, the word faith, under the image of La Virgen. An unhoused woman with sun-baked face and hands sits on the sidewalk in a nest of blankets, leaning against a wall, reading a paperback. Human ruckus on pause, the raccoons run up onto my roof, screeching. A shy coyote walks down my street, away from her hillside home. Do the sea lions in Pier 39 wonder where, where we've gone? Are the seagulls searching out scarce scraps of junk food. Neighbors gather six feet apart singing, lean on me when you're not strong. The pink moon in the lilac sky doesn't know whose lungs are collapsing. She rises golden, then silver. The street erupts with clangs and claps for healthcare workers. Late at night I sit, holding the city on pause. When we emerge from this chrysalis, what will we become? <clears throat> and uh, this is called sacred space. <laughs> Passover passes us by and my neighbors sing songs and celebrate with nightly video gatherings while feasting alone at home, praying for deliverance. Holy Saturday in Jerusalem, 500 pe people gather virtually from all over the world, praying for resurrection after the virus, for science and solidarity to carry us through. They light candles alone and together, spreading light to the occupied, the impoverished, the sick, the caregivers, reciting the Lord's Prayer in Arabic, Spanish, Italian, English, overlapping each other in a global chorus. And Ramadan begins. After a bike ride across the deserted city, I walk up the hill at sunset to seek out the new crescent and prepare myself for my journey of daytime hunger to the next new moon. A woman in white veil crosses herself and bows before the shuttered door of St. Kevin's Church. Every night at eight, Neighbors clang pots and pans, echoing the bells of Tassajara Zen Monastery, calling us to gratitude. Rafael, the poet, holds the stick of Palo Santo, swirling its sacred smoke towards the camera, invoking the east, the west, the north, the south, calling us deeper into the planet. My neighbor Ophelia sits on a concrete ledge where men used to gather to drink. Estoy orando, she says for todos, because only Dios can heal us. She recites in Spanish, as my grandmother recited, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Allah, Ya Rahim, each incantation calling her deeper into the divine, a recitation older than Cristo, older than the 99 names for the one, invoking a mystery deeper than language, as the wind prays, as the air prays, invisible, yet ever present. And all I can do is practice kindness, and pray for a redemption, a resurrection, a renewal, as we watch the grasses grow on the hillside. Um, this last poem is a, is a recent poem. Uh, but, um, I think I wrote just a couple of weeks ago. It's called To Breathe. 
Thank you to the wind for bringing us fresh air and taking our brother on his journey. Michelle and Ashley Monterrosa at the remembrance protest for Sean Monterrosa, murdered by a Vallejo police officer as he was demonstrating for Black Lives, June 5th, 2020. Wind, fresh air, to breathe, to take oxygen into the lungs so it can travel through veins, like our ancestor, the fish with lungs, who ambled onto land. Air in lungs, our animal inheritance. Where does my body begin? Where does it end? Molecules enter and leave me, dispersing into air. I breathe you, you breathe me. We stand six feet apart, cover faces, sanitize surfaces, stay home, all to protect this right to breathe. Then what of George Floyd? He survives his birth, black boyhood, black adolescence, young black manhood. He even survives the virus and keeps breathing, keeps breathing. If we hold our breath long enough, we will go unconscious and our bodies will begin to breathe again. To calm the chaos inside, Spiritual teachers tell us, focus on the breath, this miracle of air entering and leaving our lungs. Watch it, hear it, feel it. Offer gratitude to this air, this friend that accompanies us in and out of our bodies on this terrestrial journey. George Floyd survives the virus. We stay home so he can recover. And yet, Recovered lungs cannot help him when a murderer in police uniform crushes his throat. Son of a mother who pushed him out and wept at his first crying breath. He cries for her after his last breath is spent. Tell us, whose breath are we protecting now? How will we cleanse ourselves of this deadlier virus that takes away the air in our lungs. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tamina. Feeling really grateful for this breath right now. So our last featured reader is Kim Shuck, our beloved poet laureate in San Francisco, who has gotten so many of us poets to know each other and has uh, found all the people that are what San Francisco was made of before um, the skyline changed and all the Google buses started riding around um, and gotten everyone out to uh, to know each other and to speak up for uh, for what the culture has been here and uh, what we hope to maintain here. Uh, she's a native San Franciscan and a uh, Cherokee, sloggy, Polish American writer, teacher, a master beadwork artist. Uh, and she has been the best of friends to, uh, to the community and, and to poets and inspired us to step up. So Kim, Oh, I find it so hard to sit through bios. <laughs> um, I mean, I do it a lot, but I find it hard. So tonight, uh, it's an important moment in my calendar for a few different reasons. One of them is that it's Litha tonight, uh, midsummer, and um, that's kind of exciting. It's a, it's a meant to be the moment where. Um, the holly king and the and the oak king exchange 
places, one of the two big transitions in the year. And, um, and I'm spending it with you guys, so thank you for that. It's also the cusp of um, uh, one of the major times of the year for Cherokee ceremonies about corn. And um, I think it's always worth remembering that our word for corn is shalu, and our word for our creation goddess is shalu. And there's no difference between the two of those things. Mm -hmm. The, I don't think the planet's dying, but I think we might be. I want to read you f a couple of, of my daily poems, which are essentially the poetry version of Sumia style ink brush drawing. I don't edit them and I don't stop writing it until they're over. So they're imperfect in exactly the way they had to be every morning when I rate them. Quarantine poem 91. I have four blank pages where I've tried to write about the hangings. Mm. I, mother of a dead woman. My dreams wake me at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., and I rage cry by myself in the dark. Mm. Quarantine poem 92. Yesterday was a year. Where are the recipes for preventing disaster? I'm sure that grandma left me some. Leafing through the old notebook, handwritten poems of survival made of beans, made of wild caught plants the bellowers bellow, and still we know where the wisdom pools thick and terrible, and the elder women gather just outside of town, beyond the marker sticks, with chicken foot huts and butter churns, with corn mortars and hands full of strawberries, with string and cooking spoons and seeds saved for next year's planting, and the recipes of the grandmothers, and the scraps of our dead loved ones' clothes that we have tied into knots of intention. We gather with all of our love and anger and settle in for the longer fight with an even longer, terrifying memory. Quarantine poem 93. The rotating cylinder of a service revolver doesn't repeat a prayer in any religion I recognize. The kneeler in my grandmother's church was not shaped like the neck of a man, and I've never heard one call out for his. City Hall. The moan of the 2020s, the kindling, is the smoke that will carry today's prayer. Quarantine poem 94. Thursday, and six of the natural clocks are running backwards. The fireworks started early and another statue come down, stuck somewhere between celebration and anxiety sweat. On the second floor, in the eaves, of a house that has seen some things. The moss is curling up, and the cats are taking refuge in my clean and folded laundry and I miss my children. But the cool Pacific wind is coming up and sneaking in through the open windows. The year is just relentless. A wrestling match that stretches through time in all directions. But this afternoon, teasing a feral cat into playing with me, it struck me, you know, we could win this. Quarantine poem 95. If you ignore centuries of pain until you're finally driven to the doctor, finally diagnosed with a terminal disease, do you blame your cells? Foundations are ossuaries. The bones are old. The bones are food. The bones will fail. 
The bones are creation myths carved with glyphs of concealment. Even so, they are scattered by scavengers, cracked and dry marrow extracted, and the house is tilting. And I think I'm going to end with quarantine poem 96. She asked to see photos of my relatives, so I pulled up some on the laptop. The first of great grandma's cousins is him shot dead, posed against a door. She had some questions. I carry a genetic assumption coded generationally in colonized blood and bone that I won't get to pick where I die. So I never thought about it until now. We're getting old together. And because I love you, I probably have to let you go first. But if it has to happen here, so be it. This is a door I could die against. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kitty. It is such a pleasure to hear Norm and um, Tamina in the same place. And I figure uh, there are a lot of poets here that I've actually published. <laughs> <laughs> The whole thing about people talking about me, bringing them together, the point was community. And there's absolutely no excuse for using that word and then expecting somebody else to come make it true. And I'm really grateful for everybody's complicity with, with mm -hmm. my high flown idea and all of that. Thank you for having me. Mm, thank you, Kim. Yeah, we'll take up that that challenge. <laughs> um, just to make community happen and not make you be the one that makes it all happen. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say Kim's uh, quarantine poems are all on her uh, Facebook page. So if you want to read some more of them, go log in. I'm Kim Shuck on Facebook. And on the San Francisco Public Library's website, she's been publishing uh, a poem a day for a month and a half or something. Um, so you got to poke around a little bit on the library's website, but it's just been this amazing uh, collection of, of poets uh, in these times. So enjoy that. Um, so we are, of course, like much later than I thought we were going to be at this point. And I'm hoping that people on the open mic are willing to stay till 8.30. <laughs> and I know people may have um, various things they need to do. So feel free to uh, take care of yourself in whatever way you need to, coming and going or uh, bio breaks and all of that. So. Um, I'd like to, for us to just take a couple minute break. I am going to, uh, I'm going to get up and shake out is what I'm going to do, but I'm also going to um, do a thing that I haven't done a lot, which is to share my screen. So while we have a three minute break, um, I am going to play this little slideshow. I can figure out again how to do this. Um, a lot of it is photos that um, a friend of a friend took, an old Vietnam vet who's been up in the Chaz area that's been, uh, I don't know if it still is, but they kind of kicked all, not kind of, they kicked all the cops out. <laughs> and people have taken over, uh, taken over the area. So, um, it's that and, and some uh, photos mostly from Minneapolis. So I'm going to run this while we get a chance to get up and stretch, move, whatever you need to do.
Hmm. All right. Oh, thank you all for hanging in there when we're sitting in one spot for so long here. So, um, I am going to adopt Kim Shuck's open mic rules because they are really good rules. <laughs> Um, and add add a little uh, extra to it. Sometimes uh, we everybody can read one poem or sing one song. Uh, sometimes people come in with a novel length poem, so we're limiting it to three minutes. Um, and the rules are: you uh, when it's your turn, you say your name, no commentary. You read your poem, and that's it. Uh, I know there was at least one person on the call who uh, wanted to make uh, an announcement about some some uh, open mic work that he's doing. So uh, when we get to Dan, he's got. We'll have a moment to uh, inform us about that. And if you have some other uh, important thing like that that you wanted to share, then. Um, you know, that would be okay, but for the most part, the most part, we're just say your name, say your name, call read your poem. Yes. Yes. Um, I wonder is that can everyone hear Kitty okay? Kitty okay. Oh. No, okay, yeah, there's a problem with your mic, I think. Is it on the call? Can you hear me okay? Video, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I think it just comes and goes. Um, is it still doing it? Did you guys get the, uh, what I just said about the rules for the reading? Yeah? The, the sound is back. The sound is back. Ah, okay. Or maybe? Uh, yes, no? Now it's okay. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> so you guys heard what I said about the, uh, just saying your name and reading the poem or singing the song and? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so. Um, we'll roughly run through in the order people signed up. Um, so first up, oh, wait a minute, actually, I wanted to read something um, very short. Uh, some of you know I've been uh, for decades now clipping my junk mail and occasionally I, ha I have big flurries of making poems out of my junk mail and um, the lockdown has given some time for that <laughs> and it's also it can be really helpful when things are stressful uh, you know sometimes for some people to not have a blank page but that still be able to be creative can be um, easier when you're, when you're under a lot of stress. So I've been doing more of that. So this one is called Three Little Words. Looks like that. And every line is three words, just the way I clipped them out. So this is for you, you readers. Three little words. Nearest and dearest, raise your voice. It's an emergency. Make a statement, your own spin. Nothing to memorize. Are you in? Sing your prayers, a broken alleluia, disturbing the peace. It's not crazy. Your response is how we heal. Your mouth is in the room. Aren't we lucky? Strike a match. <laughs> So, first up, first up Marco. 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 Oh. Is it still, is it, is the sound okay? It wasn't and now it is. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but Gail, it's I, you. 
Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. My name is Gail Marco. This poem is titled Morning Prayer, and it's been a poem in progress since February. Each morning, she steps outside, fills her eyes with sunrise, clouds shape and color shift gray to pink, low-lying fog, high-flying cirrus, a pale crescent moon in the western sky, the greens of trees. She inhales fresh oxygen, the ocean, redwoods, and the mother tree two yards over. On days there are fires, she sniffs for it, feels the tiny burn in her nostrils from up north, down south, across the ocean. Remember Santa Rosa, Paradise, Ojai, Australia. She prays, help, she sings, begging nature's realm like crows beg their morning alms. She begs her prayers carried on the wind by crows. What must they think? Soon they'll be bringing her breakfast bits. Thank you, she'll say, though food, though lack of food is not her issue. She appreciates someone's trying to de decipher her cry and help. Her human world is busy squawking about coronavirus, and after all, more than 20 million died of the Spanish flu in 1918. It could happen again. She wonders what it felt like in Europe in 1933 when Hitler first came to power, when the first detention center, Dachau, was established for undesirables, and then horrifying medical experiments were done on children. She wonders what were the inc increments of the concentration of state power, its incitement to othering those not Aryan, not Hitlerian, or we could say not white American, not Trumparian, that finally led to Kristallnacht in 1938, to Tulsa in 1921. She wonders what it felt like in America in the winter of 1861 before the Civil War broke out that spring. Did they see it coming? Did they breathe fresh air? Notice the behavior of crows. The Civil War came like the Spanish flu, only less lethal in the moment. Only 620,000 died, only. Not the 20 or 50 million killed by the virus. But more would die in a war that wouldn't, had already died, the way Confederate flags still fly and statues stand till now the way 100 years of Jim Crow and lynching became a way of life, a daily unreported war waged on and on, and now five more. The way slave labor continues in countless prisons today, the way nothing, a questionable $20 bill, the selling of cigarettes on a street corner, a jog, a snooze in the car, a sleep in your own bed can get a black man or woman killed, the way everything, endless evidence can exonerate a sociopathic Aryan American president. And everyone knows, everyone sees and knows. She worries as she writes that words, that true words, that woman's words, that black people's words, that crow's words, that tree's words, that poet's words, no longer have currency except what racist patriarchal power deems so. Can anyone's words make a difference now? On the much maligned social media, she's introduced to and hears the voices of new young leaders, Austin Channing Brown, Azure Antoinette, Brittany Cooper, Tarana Burke, Rachel Cargill. She hears, she feels in her bones, the time of change is upon us. She writes a little, but mostly these days, she listens. In the afternoons, she listens to her new teachers, all the lessons not taught in school. Each morning, she steps out on her back porch among the trees and crows. She listens. She remembers to breathe and pray. Stubbornly, she picks up her pen. Crow, she writes. Tree. Air. Listen. Thank you, Gail. Do I sound weird still? No. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Don Neal. No? Oh. I, I'm going to listen tonight. Thank you. Oh, OK. So glad you're here. 
Sally. Sally, you're muted. I can also unmute you if you'd like. Uh, I think I'm on. This is a poem written by my friend Ash Sangaram. What can I do? What can I do to relieve the suffering I see? What can I do about all this debris? What can I do when I can't go anywhere? What can I do when breath becomes air? What can I do when there's a knee on his neck? What can I do without awareness of breath? What can I do when plague becomes fire? What can I do when there's no lack of ire? If there's a place where each listens to all, if there's a time when trust raises up tall, if there's a reason for no harm to befall, if there's a truth immutable that lives, if there's a way that can give us perspective, how can I know what I'm able to give? What should I do if I'm not black and I'm not white? What should I do if power takes away rights? What should I do if school remains closed? What should I do if I can't drink from the fire hose? What should I do if I can't calm her fears? What should I do if I can't stop his tears? If there's a place where we can all rest, if there's a time when no one is best, if there's a reason for peace to protest, if there's a salve that can heal the burn, if there's a being to whom we return, how should I know what I could have learned? What will I do when faced with this challenge? What will I do when they seek revenge? What will I do to place one step before two? What will I do without knowing you? What will I do to abolish these thoughts? What will I do to fight and have not? When there's a way to support every cause, when there's a time to reflect or to pause, when there's a reason why this should occur, when there's a path to banish the conjured, when there's a love who will save us from us, how will I prepare to face all of this? Thank you, Sally. Uh, what's the poet's name again? Ash Sangoram, and I think he's present tonight. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Deepti is our next reader. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. M my name is Deepti and thank you Anita for the invitation. Um, my poem is called Here and Now. Here and Now. Who are you waiting for? What would they say? When will they come? What's keeping them at bay? Who is here but you? The one that seems like two. Who are you convincing? And who is making a fool of you? The time has never been before the time 
will never be after. If the time is not now, then time is just never. The place is not this, the place was not that. If the place is not here, then the place is nowhere at. This way is not right, this way is not wrong. If the way is already made, then how will the way be born? The space, time, and you is a speck in the entire. So go on, light up. Both ashes and heat come with fire. Thank you. Thank you, Deep T. Are you up in, in Bernal with Anita up there? I Somehow I thought that was Bernal out your window. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <sighs> so, um, Florencia? Hi. Um, uh, yeah, Florencia Milito. Um, lullaby. Eyes and trees, eyes and trees, and maybe, maybe. I know words will not stop the armies or the tortures, and these days I think of little besides. Still, I draw imaginary trees, eyes and trees, eyes and trees, and even, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Florencia. Okay, Dan Brady. Here I am. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dan. Uh, so, um, as you said, I'm going to do this very quickly. I just posted something in the chat bar for everyone to see. It's um, it's the global open mic, and I figured no one is going to give poets an open mic, a global voice. So why don't we make a global open mic and give them our voice or make a way to be heard? It's it's just starting. Um, I'm looking for people to say, yeah, I'll help out. All right. So. Um, Many of the bases I've thought about reading are covered, so I'm going to read something different. It's actually optimistic. Well, for a fashion. If you know Carlos Ramirez or remember him, he was a poet that I used to, that I knew. And this is for him, it's called Worlds. Oh, my friends, there are worlds and good ones. Beautiful worlds, so wondrous and full of marvels as to make one weep. There are worlds where peace is all there is, and nature is let to run rampant. A verge is rank with skies and seas full of life. Animals who see your soul's light with hearts innocent of fear or rage. There are worlds gowned in clouds of delight, graced with rivers of love, where ranges upon ranges of emotional peace rest under the glowing countenance of their moons, dancing in the firmament. Worlds such as songs are made of, as epic poems might suit, where painters upon an overlook could gaze at a life's work just set before them. Where God is happy, life tamed, and where we'd be glad to be if we were there instead of where we are, dazed and confused by our own earthly illusions. Forsake fight and flight, let go of want our past histories of unending sorrows, poor reasoning, and martial drums. 
For there are worlds, this poor, poor scribbler asserts, that no artist could hope to convey without a proper preparation, a long, long restful life of enjoyment, a million-year picnic. Then they could provide a semblance of one such world. So I tell you, this is a magnificent universe, well-made and fit for who but us, or maybe those of our kind. It is like that magical, mystical Ganges with its endless beaches, where each glowing sand grain is a full repository of galaxies strung like beads set in a glowing firmament of stardust. So there are worlds. And then there's us and our longing our song so profoundly deep and unending that even this grand universe and all of its works couldn't possibly contain it. Or so I feel, or so I feel, and that's the good news. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who came before. Wow. Mm, thank you, Dan. Ah, and thank you for bringing Carlos into the room. He actually uh, came to a meditation group that many of us uh, participate in. So really nice to have his spirit brought into the room. What a, what a joyful being. <laughs> And for anybody who doesn't know, Dan Brady has been running the open mic for many, many years at um, Sacred Grounds, which is the longest running open mic. Is it 40 years now? Yeah, it's way up there. I, I, <laughs> they're heading for their 50th. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, um, well, I, I want to just break things up here maybe with uh, Astrid. Do you, do you feel like it's a good time to play us a song? Yeah, I love that. So um, my name is Astrid and I'm going to be singing, sending you light from Melody de Moore, um, who's a wonderful, fierce, talented, black activist in the Bay Area. So let me just pull my lyrics over here. Okay. For those of you who know the song, feel free to sing along. Can you all hear? Yeah? Okay. Sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I'm sending you light to hold you in love. No matter where you go, no matter where you be, you'll never walk alone. I feel you deep within. I'm sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I'm sending you light to hold you with love. No matter what you feel, or what you choose to show. I'm 
I'm always there for you. So I want you to know I'm sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I'm sending you light to hold you. In love. Yeah, when things are difficult, hold yourself in love like your best friend would. <laughs> ah, Astrid, another talent. <laughs> Thank you. And so nice to, you know, it just goes with, the, Astrid is from Tahiti, so just the feeling of the ukulele and uh, the Pacific Islands is very sweet. Thank you. Well, let's see, Marcy, do you feel like you can follow that? Um. No, but I will. <laughs> um, my, my name is Marcy Ryan, and this is not a quarantine poem. It's called Power Pink. I was, I was once a flounce, frill, froth, the essence of fluff, cotton candy. Don't worry your head about it, dear. I was see your face shiny, patent leather Mary Janes, and crinolines out to hear, the seen and not heard girl, a girdled simper tottering on spike heels, or I was the pale, faded, and pasty, limp wristed lispy color, the colorful girl babies and faggots and old ladies' roses. Yes, I was pink, and no serious woman would be caught dead with me then. Now, I blaze in neon fuchsia shades, reclaim no longer shamed. Pink as in queer and proud, pink as in code pink, speaking truth to power, decked out in ostrich plumes in all colors of azaleas and vibrant geraniums, 16 tints for lips too hot to touch. As you declare, you'll love who you please and make love, not war deep shocking pink because I'm hussy pink, not wussy pink. I'm in your face power pink, pink the chamber of the conch, the lining of the womb we all come from. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. W was Cliff wanting to read a poem too or? No, he, he stepped out. Okay. But thank you for the invitation via Cliff because that's how I got here. Yeah, yeah. Um, great to hear you. So, Susanna. Hey, so um, my name is Susanna Prever Perez, and um, my poem is called My Name Can Dance, and it's dedicated to the island of Puerto Rico. My name is round syllables, sweet orange, and light of moon. My name can dance barefoot like Yamaya, collecting cowrie shells and sea foam. You can drink water from my name. Say my name softly like a prayer, searching for a home, and I'll shelter you. Butcher my name, I'll taste blood on my tongue. Trampled dip thongs and deleted accents are battleships breaching my shore. My name once meant noble, but you changed it to port of riches, not accolade, but expose. To you, I am quarry and gold. My name is round mountains, fertile soil, cycles of the moon. My name can feed a nation with plantain and breadfruit. You can heal wounds with my name. Say my name softly like a lover and light will sparkle on a calm sea. Seek to conquer my name and see rebellion rise on choppy waters. Thank you. Mm 
<sighs> Thank you. Nice to nice to meet you <laughs> from afar, Susanna. <laughs> So Patricia Liney, Liney, I'm sorry. Um, so I, um, I'm going by Liney these days. It's more fun than Patricia. Patricia sounds so Roman. Okay. There's a wide black hole in the tree. Oh say, can you see a bludgeoning blowed from dark fear road? Swollen heads and swollen waters. Keep a grip just the tip of the land and hold. All traces, all our faces in a cerulean sky go by. Along the edge of neighborhoods, strewn and broken, double down, double down, take this town. With the 45th, his words rain out the earth, fully automatic, bodies on the ground. And what will I do trying to eschew all that I already knew? We've been here before with the assembly of prominent noses, bringing out the hoses. Unfold your arms, beware the charms with tongues and thongs and fingers groping for ropes to hang others. Flings of false flare, all hair, don't get drunk from the TV myth, no more working stiffs. What will I do trying to eschew all that I already knew? Thank you, Liney. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, coming up into the home stretch here, Anita. All right. Wasn't sure there was time. Is there? Um, we're just going with what we got here. I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everybody's hanging in there, so I'm, I'm just going. All right. So I'm Anita Klein, and uh, this poem is called After the Revolution. And um, it begins with a, a I wrote it uh, based on a quote, which I will read first. Uh, this is a quote from Lori Mazur, who is a climate scientist. Uh, with the story of climate change, the loss is tremendous and heartbreaking. And it seems so much easier to imagine these losses than to imagine that we could create a different form of living on the planet. After the revolution. After the revolution, a prepositional phrase we young lefties used to utter or mutter while dreaming or denouncing, depending. You don't hear it much anymore. Even the Bernie Kratz don't mean exactly that, not barricades not off with their heads. We know now it will be harder, require much more or surprisingly less than armies armed with guns. After the evolution is more like it, but not quite. Evolution being ongoing, not one precise moment, but moments unfolding as they do, have done, are doing as I write, as you listen, as we imagine our words and ourselves into the next arising, there's no relaxing after to hope for in that. Even now, as an old woman, I'm not ready to die. Not yet. I want to imagine into life another chapter, write with you and you a few more pages of what comes next and then next. Remembering to remember to not know, to let go of needing to know how it all ends, or even whether life will hold on at all. Thank you, Anita. 
Um, if my sound's working okay, I think I'm going to read a poem and then have Kimi be the closer here. Is that okay with you, Kimi? Um, sorry, I went to my poet, poetry page here, so I hope that was okay. I didn't see. <laughs> so I just wrote a poem this morning. It just kind of came. And it's a little on the lighter side in a way. So I'm going to go for this one. If it will open. Ah. Hi, my name is. To my Italian American brothers and sisters upon the toppling of Columbus statues. Have no fear. Sign ups for Italian heroes start here. Smelt. Frank Rizzo into Sacco and Vanzetti, smelt Columbus into Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And while we're at it, hail Mario Andretti. Praise George Moscone and Quentin Tarantino, Diane De Prima, De Niro, and Al Pacino, or Madonna, Serpico, and Cesar Card Cardini, Nancy Pelosi, and Chef Boyardee. The list has begun, say their names out loud. Keep adding to it until you feel proud. <laughs> Just wanted to put a little laugh in there. When was the last time you thought about Chef Boyardee? <laughs> All right, and we'll have Kimi bring us around to the home, the home stretch here. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope I'm not um, going over the same material, but I, I wrote this just recently. It's Tuesday in paradise, held by sand, warmed by sun, caressed by wind, kissed by waves, racing children, family picnics, all day dreams of peace. Nighttime, lynching, gassing, beating, shooting, disinfectant sprayed on imprisoned migrants. Slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants are hell on earth, even without COVID-19. Now add humans to the killing room floor. Two mangoes and three avocados later, skeleton shackle cracks in the pavement, fables in the making. A turn cries and dives, fighting the western wind, hunting, prodigiously hunting, hurdles east, unable to dive in the grip of wind, turns and flies against the wind to cry and dive and hunt again. When faced with suicide, overdose, murder, and pandemic, sky riding is prohibited. No escape from intent or decree a summer jacaranda bloom. Whose baby will be found hanging? Whose son will die fighting to breathe? Whose life threatened or taken at random whim? Whose child will disappear in an ice prison? Whose grandmother will die from a lack of humane prevention? Whose home will be taken? Who will be the next to go hungry, houseless, beaten? or killed, whose ears can separate truth from lies. It's Tuesday in paradise. The birds are singing an anthem for us to keep struggling to breathe. Thank you. Thank you, Kimi. Oh. So wonderful to be with all of you. Um, so we generally close uh, Buddhist gatherings, uh, it's something that a lot of different Buddhist traditions borrowed from the Tibetans. The uh, practice of dedicating the merit of our gathering. <sighs> So we dedicate any blessings from our time together to the indigenous people of this land, 
to all the immigrants, especially the dreamers, to all who are descended from enslaved people, to all who suffer or have been made afraid by sickness, violence, prejudice, or economic insecurity, for all who have lost loved ones to violence. We send our fierce, compassionate wishes for the awakening of all in power who are deluded and causing harm to others. May all the animals of the earth be well and safe from harm in the sky, in the sea, on the earth. May all climate and war refugees find safety. May all who have been abused be blessed with truth telling, justice and freedom. May we all have the courage to speak up and speak out when it is time. May we all be liberated from the illusion of separateness. May we all awaken together with true wisdom and compassion. Blessings to everyone here and in every direction. Thank you again, everyone. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to hang out for a few minutes afterwards, feel free to say, uh, to check in or say our goodbyes. But thank you especially to the featured readers. Thank you to Nessera. And I think Kim had to bow out a few minutes ago. But, and to Norm and to Tamina and everyone who stepped up to the open mic. So wonderful to hear your voices. <sighs> Thank you so much for this opportunity to um, speak into the space. Some of the things that uh, we're sharing from our hearts, sometimes a burning place but being able to uh, know that each one of us has, has a fire burning, even though it may not be white hot, it may not be blue cool, but there's fire in there. And um, I just appreciate it when we get a chance to share it. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kitty. Stay well, go well. Thank you. Thank you. Unmute everybody and everybody say goodbye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Bye, Nita. Have a beautiful Bye. Bye. evening. Bye. 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 Bye.